<laughs> Let everyone know they're being recorded. Exactly. They were now being recorded. Okay. Make sure.
All right. Okay. Oh, I'm doing it in the wrong order. There we go. There we go. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started today with our seminar. We got Rachel Shepard here today to talk to us about clinical trial development and regulation. She's been with the university for what you said, 25 years in research, 22 years in clinical trials. Yeah. So please give her your attention today. She talks to us about what she wants to talk about. <laughs> Well, hopefully it's what you want me to talk about. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I want this to be very interactive, so if you have questions, please chime in. I can't say that I know everything about this, but I will do my best to answer any questions you have. So um, I am teaching a class in public health. Um, on clinical research management, and that's why it says uh, chapter two. We actually have a book about clinical research. So, um, all right, so um, I jump right into drug development. Um, so, uh, the drug development process with the FDA is called the investigational new drug um, pathway. And um, that pathway has different uh, phases within it. So uh, we have the preclinical or laboratory section within uh, the drug development pathway. So it starts in the lab where they find a promising molecule or a promising uh, substance. They then uh, work toward having an animal model to test that drug and they gather uh, toxicity, um, carcinogenic information, reproductive information, um, efficacy information, all of those sorts of things. They look at an effective dose. They look at a maximum dose or maximum lethal dose. They do all of those things in the animal model. Um, once they feel that they have enough information in the preclinical phase, they're going to jump to uh, phase one or phase zero. But preclinical typically takes one to three years. It's a long process. Um, you might have to go through several animal models. So in a recent study uh, that we um, had a nasal, nasal drug, nasal inhaled drug, uh, we had a couple of different animal models to look at not only the the uh, tolerability of the drug through the nasal passage in rabbits, <laughs> but we also tested the drug in rats for uh, the antiviral transmission properties. So you might have a, a couple of different animal models that you're looking at. Um, phase, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, and for multiple animal models, is that to, I guess, uh, you mentioned like different spots you'd be looking at? So if this model better replicates uh, humans in like one aspect, you might use that model. Um, and so about how many animal models might a drug use? Oh, I, I mean, it really depends. But I would say that you're looking at least two to three different animal models, depending on what you're testing for and what you're looking at. But as you said, it, it's... I, and I'm no authority on drug development, but um, you know it's it's looking at an animal that has the most similar reactions and systems to the human for that particular attribute. So um, not sure why they felt nasal uh, passages of rabbits were appropriate, but um, I'm guessing that maybe it's uh, better than the bovine model or some of the others. So um, they they tend to use animal models that mirror the human reaction as much as possible. Um, and phase zero, they sometimes just do a quick check for safety. This is to accelerate the timeline of a study. So this is in very close collaboration with the FDA that they would uh, potentially do a phase zero, uh, very small, number of people exposed to the product to see if if it can be safely tested 
and those are very short. Um, that's a recent development. Um, and then we have phase one, which is the first real trial in humans, uh, maybe controlled trial in humans. So a lot of the times we're using phase one for dose ranging or finding the right dose that's tolerated um, and safe. Um, very limited efficacy. We're not really looking at efficacy in phase one. We're looking more at safety and dosing. Um, very small number of participants, usually healthy participants, not people with a disease. Of course, in cancer, that's different. But um, in most other drugs, it's um, a healthy population. Phase one takes nine to 18 months to complete on average. And um, it's in few locations. They want to really control very closely how the participants are exposed to the product and the, they want to have maybe one central laboratory that's getting all of the um, sampling and doing all the testing so that they're sure they're comparable. comparable. Um, we also do a lot of additional sampling to look at uh, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of how the drug is interacting with the body, how the body is processing the drug. Then uh, phase two uh, is uh, much larger than phase one. We're looking at safety still, but also efficacy and maybe a broader dosing rate or a broader uh, exposure to the drug, maybe not just a single exposure, but repeated exposures. Um, so we're looking at minimum and maximum effective doses within the dose range. Um, we will include people that actually have the condition that we're hoping to treat rather than healthy individuals. And um, again, we're looking at dosing and dose scheduling. So you may have one group that has, um, you know, maybe uh, one to two doses where another group may have a longer exposure or a higher dose every day. Um, sometimes uh, it really depends on the, the uh, condition. It says here often hospitalized. Uh, we do have a lot of outpatient drugs in phase two, so I'm not quite sure why uh, that information on the FDA website was there, but um, we do have a lot of phase two trials that are outpatient. Um, I think phase two that are inpatient, we're still looking at PK data for those different dosing schedules. And then uh, phase tr three trials are um, the ones that we probably do the most in the um, clinical trials unit on the other campus. Um, this is where you're looking at thousands of patients receiving the drug and you're looking at um, efficacy and, and looking very closely at any adverse effects of the uh, dosing. You may have a comparator treatment such as a placebo control or standard care versus the new care. Um, and it, it's uh, dosing based on what you expect the drug to be marketed for. So they've looked at all the previous projects what the efficacious dosing seemed to be, and now they're testing it and getting a final dosing for marketing purposes. Um, this is two to five years. So you see that um, this is the longest part, and it's because not only do you need to enroll participants, but you need to have valuable data about those participants. So if you have a lot of people that drop out, if you have a lot of people that don't finish the trial and probably the biggest problem in clinical research is you don't have enough participants. Um, so 85% of research sites fail um, because they don't enroll enough participants. It's a huge problem, especially in the United States, that we just can't find people to participate in clinical trials. And there are lots of reasons for that. Um, I would say the biggest one may be that people just don't have the information or don't understand what's available to them. Um, but there's also a lack of trust within the public. So 
I don't know if you guys have heard a lot about drug trials or had any experience um, reading about them, hearing advertisements about them. Anybody? You have? You've been in one? Okay. Um, I didn't know if any of you guys listen to NPR. They frequently have ads for drug trials, things like uh, thyroid eye disease or um, what was the other one I heard recently? Maybe gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, anyway, there are trials out there that are being advertised. Um, I think that, you know, even if I had a condition and I heard about a trial, I might be pretty reluctant to participate without hearing from someone I know who's been in a trial or has experience with clinical research. So it's a big, uh, big area that we need to work on as uh, an industry. So we also have phase 3B and phase 4. And those are usually, um, we've already seen that the drug works. Um, it can probably be approved, but we need additional information for the FDA, or we want to add additional populations or additional labeling for the product. So um, we might even have uh, requirements from the FDA to do long-term evaluation of the product. So we know it works in the short term, we know it doesn't have a lot of ill effects, but what happens when you use it for years? What changes? So we have to look at having registries or having long-term evaluation of the product. And then um, sometimes we have studies on campus that um, evaluate products that have been either uh, developed on campus, or um, maybe we have some um, investigators who are wanting to evaluate approved products in a different way. So those may need an IND as well. Um, it all depends on how we're using it and what we're looking for. So I included here the definition, the regulatory definition of a drug. It's a substance intended for use in the diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of a disease, a substance other than food intended to affect the structure or function of the body. So if you write a research protocol and you're looking at mitigating, curing, or diagnosing a disease, then that may be a product, even though it's a, maybe it's a, a probiotic that you're gonna give people. If you're looking at trying to cure a condition, then it's a drug. It's, it meets the definition of a drug, even if it's a food or a probiotic or a supplement. Um, recently had a project where um, they're looking at probiotic to treat um, alcohol syndrome. So um, it was considered a drug and we had to go and get an IND for the project. So the IRB, our Institutional Review Board, has a resource where we can evaluate whether an IND is necessary. And, um, you know, they look at things like whether or not we're going to report um, uh, the information from the trial to the FDA in support of new marketing or new labeling for the product. Um, if it's already lawfully marketed for that indication, then it may not need an IND. So this, this is designed to help us through that thought process. Um, biologics or things that are derived from tissue or animals or uh, substances that are alive. Um, those are considered a subset of drugs, so they have the same or similar process. So the governing body in FDA for drugs is called the Center for uh, Drug Evaluation Research. The uh, one that regulates biologics is called the Center for Biologics uh, Research. So we have CEDAR and CBER, um, and um, here, uh, we do a biologics license application. So 
It's a similar process to an IND, but it just has a different name because there are other implications when you're dealing with biologics, such as um, are there additional risks from exposure to biologics? Um, one project I remember in the past, we were injecting uh, virus into heart tissue. And so we had to think about if a staff member accidentally got exposed to this virus, what do we need to do? How do we protect them? So with a lot of the biologics we're testing, we have to have additional approvals from the, um, um, the Institutional Biosafety Committee. And we have to come up with an exposure plan and how we would handle all that. So there's just a lot of regulatory requirements that go along with these projects. And it's good to have an expert help you figure those out. We also have some other types of studies that are tied to FDA oversight. We have expanded or compassionate use. And um, this is becoming more uh, pro, uh, more prominent when we have promising products that are, um, you know, they're out there for things that don't have a current treatment. So one of the questions that we always ask sponsors when we have a drug for maybe a rare condition or a condition that doesn't have a lot of treatments out there is if they'll have the opportunity for a participant to continue getting the treatment after the study's over. And so that's what this is called, expash, uh, expanded or compassionate use. So um, sometimes the sponsor will say, no, we're not going to have an extension study, but you can file with the FDA to get it approved for each of your participants. So sometimes that, that's a huge administrative burden, but we're willing to do it if we see that the patient is benefiting from the treatment. So. Um, Um, this can also be used while the sponsor is pursuing market approval if, if they want to continue the treatment for the participant. And then we have emergency use. So um, this is more um, when there's a, a non-marketed product or an experimental drug, we know that it that it's uh, being tested for one purpose. Maybe there's someone that's very ill that would benefit. We know that it's probably beneficial to them, but they don't qualify for the trial that's open. So um, I saw an ep episode of House recently. Do you, does anybody watch House? I, I love that show, but it's kind of funny at times when they talk about clinical research. So um, they had, uh, a person that had cancer, she had small, uh, small cell lung cancer, and they were talking about a clinical trial that was ongoing, uh, but they couldn't get her into the trial, and um, they said, well, you know, let's trick the, the, the principal investigator of the trial to get her in, you know, let's fudge on the inclusion criteria for the trial to get her in because we know she'll benefit. Well, in fact, they should have used this mechanism. This is where you go to the FDA and you say, uh, you know, I've got a couple of practitioners opinions that this is going to be a good treatment for this person. We think it'll be effective. These are the reasons. And they'll actually approve an emergency use. And that's different than off-label use. Off-label means something is approved and we're using it as a treatment in a different way. So this is for an unapproved product. Does that make sense? So, you know, uh, an off-label use of uh, ibuprofen, maybe that you use it to, I don't know, um, thin your blood so you won't have an aneurysm. I have no idea, but I'm just saying you're looking at uh, an approved drug versus a non-approved drug. And then we have orphan drugs. Um, does anybody know what orphan diseases are? Do you have any idea? You want to give it a shot? Um, I don't remember the exact definition, but it's basically a disease that typically is rare and have a lot of 
Yeah, so the, historically, this has been a, a real challenge in the industry. Again, if it's an orphan disease, I think by definition, it affects less than 20,000 people a year in the US. Um, and drug and device companies, are they going to be real motivated to develop new products for, for orphan diseases? Probably not. It's not going to be very lucrative for them. So, um, yeah, 1983, the U.S. government said, we're going to incentivize industry to come up with treatments for some of these diseases. Cystic fibrosis is one of those, um, childhood disease of the lungs. It's, it's rapidly getting to the point that it's no longer going to be um, um, in the same status because people are surviving longer with the disease and we have more people with that disease now. Isn't that interesting? So, um, but anyway, this, this um, pathways was developed for companies to get incentivized or get funding to develop more rare treatments and um, they get grant money from the government. They get special incentives such as longer patents and um, they really increase the number of orphan treatments available um, by having this regulation. So, uh, Oh, yeah, I got it right. 20,000 20, <laughs> or 200,000. Sorry, I was off by a factor of 10. Um, so uh, since 1983, 325 treatments were developed due to the Orphan Drug Act. Now, the device development process is radically different from drugs. Um, but before I get into it, any other questions about drugs you guys want to ask? I may not know, but you're certainly welcome to ask. Okay. So, um, performance of device trials uh, are different because you're looking at more specific things about the device. Um, you have a better idea of what to expect because it's more of a mechanical effect rather than a a drug effect. Um, I think that the biggest factor in device trials is the skill of the clinician or the surgeon. If it's an implantable device, that's going to make a huge difference in the performance of that device. Um, an instrument, apparatus, implement, machine, contrivance, implant, in vitro reagent, or other similar or related article, including a component part or accessory, which is recognized in the official national formulary or United States pharmacopoeia, or any supplement to them, intended for use in the diagnosis of disease or other conditions. That sounds familiar. Um, or in the cure mitigation or treatment or prevention of disease in man or other animals. Again, sounds familiar. Intended to affect the structure or any function of the body of man or other animals and which does not achieve its primary intended purposes through chemical action within or on the body of a man or other animal and which is not dependent upon being metabolized for achievement of its primary intended purpose. So they're trying to differentiate between a device and a drug, but sometimes it's really tough. Um, one of the things that surprised me when I was working um, on some projects is that when you're looking at a laboratory assay to diagnose something, that's a device, even though it's a uh, you know, a, a test in the laboratory that's considered a device. So um, very, very interesting and very broad category. So what are, how, how are devices classified? So we have class one devices, which are simple, low risk, minimal potential for harm. And those are bandages, gloves, crutches, um, Class two is more complex or moderate, moderate risk. So we may have surgical drapes or infusion pumps. And then class three, they're very complex, high risk. Um, they're usually used to su su uh, support or sustain life. 
Um, and they actually have a database, a uh, national database that's used for um, listing all these products and their classifications, if you're interested. Um, but if you don't know what class your device is, you have to um, submit what's called a 513G application to the FDA to have them help you determine the classification of your device. And I am showing right now, anybody know what this is in the picture? I'm sorry? LBAD. Yes, Le uh, left ventricular assist device, LBAD. Uh, my team works very closely with the cardiothoracic surgeons on testing these, so. All right, so again, we have classifications of devices and then we have risk categories. Um, so we have non-significant risk and significant risk, and obviously all class three devices are gonna be significant risk. Class two probably will be too, but class one, uh, Probably not. In fact, class two is a 50-50 split. Um, so when you're looking at a non-significant risk device, um, it doesn't pose a significant risk to your participants, but the IRB has to agree with you that you uh, are not po posing a significant risk. So again, we write a protocol if we're gonna test a, a, new, um, a new bandage on someone, we might write a protocol and um, the IRB has to agree. Or more currently, we are going to test a new swab that was 3D printed for COVID testing. That's one of the ones I wrote during the pandemic. So um, that was a non-significant risk device trial, but we had to um, submit it to the IRB and the IRB had to agree with us. The kicker is that the FDA can decide later that they don't agree with you and the IRB. So you need to be pretty confident about your decisions. Um, significant risk um, means that there's a risk to the health, safety, or welfare of a participant, um, substantially important in diagnosing, curing, and mitigating, or treating disease. So again, we get another decision sheet or a resource from our IRB to help us decide uh, how to move forward, whether we should have an IDE or not. And this can get very confusing when you read it. Um, uh, does the study involve a medical device that is being used in accordance with its labeling that has been approved and cleared by the FDA? If no, please continue. Um, if the medical device, uh, is the medical device a diagnostic device? If yes, then go to question three. Um, so here we're looking at if it complies with the labeling requirements, if the testing is non-invasive, if it doesn't require invasive sampling that presents a significant risk, if it does not by design or intention introduce electric or energy into a subject, not electricity. Um, if the testing is not used as a diagnostic procedure. Um, so if, if all of those um, are, let's see, if all are true, then what happens? It's exempt, yes, that's what I thought. So um, again, you have to go through that decision-making pro process. Um, most of the time, if we are doing this worksheet, we're probably looking at a significant risk device. So we're probably uh, in the number four category. So we have to look at, is it intended as an implant and presents a potential for serious risk? Maybe not. Um, is the investigational device purported or represented to be for use in supporting or sustaining human life and presents a potential for serious risk? So chances are, if you've gotten this far, um, it's going to be an IDE, but um, you do have to look at each of these categories. So there are a few different review 
uh, pathways for devices. And I think devices are not as tightly regulated as drugs, although I think it's getting better. I still think there's a lot of wiggle room out there in devices that just isn't there for drugs. So um, if it's a class one device or it's already approved, it's exempt from IDE. So it's in the exempt category. Um, we have some that are um, in the pre-market notification category or five, you might have heard 510K. Um, that's used a lot. Uh, we're looking at substantial equivalency to something else that's already out there. Um, and it usually has a 90 day review timeline before marketing. So a lot of, a lot of device manufacturers use this process. Um, then um, I'm going to skip over to pre-market approval. So that's for the IDE high risk devices. That's what the majority of the trials we perform are on. Um, we have uh, de novo, which is a newer pathway. Um, so it's not substantially equivalent, but it's a lower risk device. So you might go in with your 513G uh, application. They tell you it's a lower risk, so you can choose the de novo pathway to get approval. And then humanitarian device exemption. Again, this might be used for rare diseases or rare conditions. So um, if we have a certain type of aneurysm and we know this certain coil that we're testing could be beneficial to a patient, we may file for humanitarian device exemption. So um, that would be, you know, if they didn't qualify for any of the clinical trials again that were being done on that device, we could use this mechanism. So on the drug side, it's the emergency use. On the device side, it's the humanitarian device exemption. Does all that make sense? <laughs> okay, so we also have some newer things that are coming along due to technology. We have um, software that's intended to be used for medical purposes that perform uh, without being part of a hardware medical device. So. I don't, I mean, this is in the regulations. I don't really know much about it. I didn't know if you guys might know of any examples. Sometimes there's like, you can do mapping of tumor sizes and stuff like that. So you're not actually doing anything with the patient, but you're using like their previous scans or something like that. Oh yeah, AI, yeah. exactly. Very good example. Any others that you can think of? I know right now we have um, some researchers that are looking at getting aggregate data for patients that have had uh, coronary artery bypass grafts. And they're looking at, I guess a lot of them have um, acute kidney injury afterward. So they're looking at ways of looking at the data of all these patients to come up with an algorithm to detect when someone is at high risk for acute kidney injury. So I think, again, that may be considered a, a device. Um, so again, any, any uh, regulation that's governing devices, you're going to find in 21 CFR Part 12. Um, for drugs, it's 21 CFR uh, 312 instead of 812. Um, and then we have the Safe Medical Devices Act of 1990. And um, I found this on Drug Watch. More than 1.7 million injuries and nearly 83,000 deaths can be linked to medical devices over the past 10 years. The AMA predicts that 10% of, of Americans will undergo a medical device implantation at some point in their lifetime. Fewer than 0.5% 0, 0 of implanted devices have likely received testing through intensive clinical trials. And I think that's because of that 510K process. So it's kind of a shocking uh, figure that 
nearly 10% of Americans may have implanted devices. That's unbelievable. So um, the other thing that you should know about uh, drugs and devices is that, that we on, have ongoing reporting uh, requirements after something is approved with the FDA. So uh, there is an FDA form 3500, it's called the MedWatch form. And, um, you know, if you go to your doctor and you report a problem with a drug or device, this is what they're going to use to report to the FDA. And that's how we get a lot of those black box warnings or post-marketing pulls, is that enough events have been reported to a primary physician that uh, the FDA has to take notice and take action. So, um, so my group has a huge responsibility. Anybody who is conducting a clinical trial has a huge responsibility in ensuring that you're collecting accurate data and that you're reporting everything correctly. Because, um, you know, if, if you're uh, seeing that somebody has a mild headache, um, but um, you don't report it because you don't think it's a big deal, well, what you don't know is that at least three people at every site conducting the trial have the same headache and it may be an early sign of a more serious condition. So we do have a huge responsibility to accurately collect and report this data because long term, I mean, I've seen it a few times in my career. Um, what was that lovely pain drug, Vioxx, um, that they had to pull from the market because of cardiovascular problems later on that they observed in the public? So, um, you know, there's always some new and surprising thing that could happen. In all of our consents, we say there are other risks that we may not know about. Um, so uh, we have to tell our participants that, you know, we think these are the things that could happen, but there are other things that could happen. And that's why we're doing the research. Um, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be research, right? So again, just an overview of this drug process. I wanted to show you this because, you know, when you map it all out, this is a 12 to 15 year process. So um, when you think of the chunks, it doesn't seem like so long, but when you put it all together, that's a long time. That's a significant investment. Um, I'm sure you can imagine how much money some of these trials cost. Um, if we're looking at a class three device trial, such as a VAD trial uh, or an LVAD trial, um, each patient that we recruit, uh, the budget is probably $25,000 just to, just for one patient. And we have to test it in hundreds of patients. So that adds up very quickly. And that's just our little piece of the pie at the site. So it's a very expensive prospect. Again, it's kind of like a funnel, you know, uh, as you go further in the testing, more and more products fail. So from phase one to the approval, the success rate is only 10%. If you include preclinical, that goes way down. Um, so once you start testing in man, phase one to phase two, we have a 63% success rate. Uh, phase two to phase three, it drops to 31%. Phase three to a new drug application or biologic licensing agreement, it goes down 58%. So, um, and that FDA review lasts a year. So you lose another year there. But, um, yeah, it's pretty shocking how difficult it is to go from concept to market. And then I, I just wanted to include some things to give you an idea of, you know, just the overall picture right now. So, um, again, the top issues that uh, impact our site or our studies here at UofL, uh, site staffing and retention is top. 
I'm sure that's not a shock to any of you who've been to a restaurant and can't get waited on. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a huge issue. And um, in this industry, it takes about, I would say, at least a year for you to have someone trained enough to act independently. So uh, it's a huge investment, too. Um, patient recruitment and enrollment is number two. And um, as I said, 85% of studies fail to recruit enough participants. Um, 15 percent of sites fail to enroll a single person. So they do all the work to get IRB approval, to get all the documentation in place, to do the contracting, everything gets done and they don't enroll a patient. That's very disappointing. Um, and then 5 percent of patients participate in clinical trials. So again, there's a real disconnect. How do we how do we reach people? How do we get them engaged? Part of the problem is how the trials are designed or how specific they are. So um, inclusion, exclusion criteria, we're looking for a certain type of patient. And if our patient doesn't meet those criteria, we can't include them. So I would say a lot of the time, that's one of the big factors, but we're trying to get better. There are still some issues out there. Um, I would say one of the biggest ones right now is um, diversity, equity, and inclusivity, and also um, body mass index. We want to enroll, you know, people with a low body and mass index. Well, what happens when we do that? And we don't know if the drug works in somebody with a higher body mass index. It, historically, it's been a male-female thing. We only wanted to enroll males, no females. We didn't want to take risks related to reproductive issues. Well, again, we got into the uh, situation where we didn't know how drug, how effective drugs would be for our female patients. So a lot of things to consider. So how do we get trials at UofL? We, uh, we may see on clinicaltrials.gov, one of our investigators sees a promising uh, product or treatment, and they ask us to contact the, the lead site. Um, we have partnerships with clinical research organizations. So there are a lot of organizations out there that run trials for sponsors, such as Pfizer, Merck, Lilly, and um, they're responsible for organizing, managing all the uh, research sites. So it, we have partnership agreements with them. So they know our capabilities and they come to us with the right projects. Um, we advertise on CenterWatch, which is a, um, it's an industry website where a lot of sites and sponsors connect. We go to a professional meeting. So I made a lot of connections with um, different sponsors at, you know, professional meetings. And then there are grant programs. So um, not only does NIH, DOD, NSA, they all have grant programs, but also private companies can have grant programs. They're looking at trying to um, increase the notoriety or the reputation of their product by having a researcher come in and design a project that includes their product. So, And lastly, I just wanted to talk about FDA because it was a huge impact on the industry. We have to make information about the research we're doing public. So clinicaltrials.gov is the primary source for that. And if you've ever not been there, I would encourage you to go just to see the site, see what it's about. Um, you can search for any number of uh, disease conditions, products, drugs, um, and see what's going on out there. It lists um, all the uh, requirements of the project, where it's being conducted, uh, what they're hoping to treat. Um, and um, if you're running your own trial, you have to post your information there. And you're not just posting that the trial is going on, you're posting your results. So um, this was to keep people from having negative trials and not publishing them. 
So all the journals got together and said, you know what, we're going to have an international requirement that if if you're going to publish, then you have to make your trial and your results public. And so uh, this was the United States way of getting that accomplished. Um, I think that's the end of my presentation. Any questions for me? Sure, go ahead. You know that like, uh, like FDA in the US, there are other certification agencies like in Europe, there is CE. Mm -hmm. um, any device or drug that has a CE certification, let's say a device, and we want to um, try to market it in the US as well. Do they still have to go through all the FDA process, or is it going to be like an expedited uh, uh, process for that? That's a great question. So um, one of the things that happened in the last, I want to say 20 years, is that we came up with um, the International Committee on Harmonization um, has the good clinical practice regulations. So we're trying to worldwide have standards as we're all following for research. So when you do have that European approval, you can come to the United States with your data and get a more expedited uh, approval process. It probably depends on where you conducted the trial and what kind of data you have, but the FDA will review that and let you know where you fall. Yeah, good question. Do you have one? Yeah, so um, what if you like, have a device, but you just want to add like another use for it. Is there another process, or do you have to go through like whole thing over? That would be um, it'd be a post marketing trial on the device side. On the drug side, it's called phase four. I think sometimes they use phase four for devices too, although it's not accurate. But it would be a post marketing um, study, and it's a much uh, probably a much uh, shorter process because you're looking at a final phase trial. It still might require a good number of people because you're changing the indication. So it might be a larger number of people, but again, it's only that last phase trial. Anything else? Okay. The first one would be the safety devices I can say that so for the FDA, what is the term they give it? I mean, like if you have a problem you are working on and you have like, for example, 400 or 300 patients that you have tried and working on and you have some specific results, this is for the FDA concept like big data, or do you have a specific threshold to say this is big data and can be go into the FDA steps and then go to the market? or like just like this patient, the number is not enough uh, to work through the process of the FDA. That's a good question. I, I'm telling you, you've reached the limit of my knowledge on that one. Um, I would love to know more about the AI process. We haven't done a lot of research at UofL with AI or machine learning yet. So, but I'll get back to you because I, I would be very interested in researching that a little bit. Discover that some drug is not working fine after a specific period in the market, you're going to investigate more on that, right? Like we can what? I'm sorry? You're going to investigate more on that or just like withdraw the, the drug from the market? Um, yeah, I mean, probably wouldn't get withdrawn from the market. The labeling might be required to be changed or um, if it pose significant risks that weren't identified before it might get pulled from the market. But I think usually sponsors might say, well, it's not look working great, but maybe we can find a, a more suitable indication. Uh, a prime example was Viagra, where it was designed to treat cardiovascular disease. Well, it didn't work so great for that, but it worked great for erectile dysfunction. So, um, you know, that's that was a win for the company that they they uh, they noted those effects and they re, re oriented themselves to it.
to a different indication. So. But for sure you have to get some claims or some, some people who are quoting or suing the, uh, the company for that right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the efficacy thing, that's tough. I mean, because we hear right now, I, th I think I've been hearing in the news that they're saying that, uh, I'm trying to remember what drug it was. It just doesn't work as well as they thought. Wasn't this the new Alzheimer drug that was like ineffective, but safe, but supposedly worked? Yes, I think that's what I'm thinking about. I don't know that they'll have to pull it from the market, but people are going to hear about it and probably stop. Physicians will stop using it. It essentially gets eliminated from the market. But if like a drug has been in the market for 20 years and uh, some new research discovered that this drug might have some risk or some mm -hmm. uh, bad effects on the future generation, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, will a new investigation be open for that drug or just like forget about it? It has been in the market for. Oh, no, you would open a new uh, investigation. So uh, when they did pivot on Viagra, they probably didn't have to go all the way back to phase one, but they probably had to start with maybe phase 2B, where they're looking at the efficacy in the target population. Yeah. Another example would be Zantac, which was removed for being carcinogenic. It was an antacid, like over the counter mm -hmm. anti reflux, um, and it was just found to be cause cancer. So it was completely removed. And it's been out for years. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I like the I like this discussion. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, so for like humanitarian devices, if you're like creating something and you're like, my goal is for it to only be used in this really small circumstance, but it has the opportunity to be bigger, would you like start there or would you be like eventually down the road it might be more applicable so I should do this? Well, I think it depends on what your goals are. And you know. the marketing claim has to be approved with my understanding. Like yeah. Any legal marketing claim you're making for the product it has to be FDA approved. Mm -hmm. But I mean, where you would start is probably where you could get funding. So chances are you're going to be looking at the broader use first, mm -hmm. just because research doesn't get done without funding. Let's go ahead. You're working on a device that you think is class one. It has the uh, if, if your your estimation of that is correct. So there is that listing right. that the FDA has. So you could look at whether there's an equivalent device, or you can file that application. I think it's called the 513G um, to have the FDA look at classifying it for risk. So if there's nothing close comparison, you'd have to. Yeah, you'd have to get in touch with the FDA. Mm -hmm. well, let's give Thanks for having me. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.